I'm John Ray. I'm a professional ultra trail runner running for Hoka, and I'm living in South Boulder. Yeah, I think it's important you said John Ray, not John Ray, because I feel like everyone says Ray, and I know that's wrong. <laughs> I wish it were spelled differently, to be honest, but yeah, you know, it would be disrespect to my family name to try to change it. So I'll keep it spelled that way, but it's pronounced Ray. <laughs> Awesome. Good to know. Everyone says my last name wrong too. So I, I kind of feel your pain, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I guess uh, today we're gonna just going to talk about Havelina. I guess we're a week or so out after. That's a little bit, a little more or so, but we've been trying to nail down the time to talk about it and you know, go over your, your pacing strategy because being out there filming, I was filming some stuff uh, with Zach Bitter and just being up in the lead pack all day, just saw you just running super smooth. So I'm curious about your pacing strategy and then your nutritional strategy, which is interesting in a race that is this fast and just just consistent the whole time. And also you taking your ticket to States because you've won a couple in the past and here you are going back. Yeah, all fun, exciting topics. <laughs> yeah, well let's um let's just start with the nutritional aspect of it. Like I know everyone's so different. Like a lot of people just kind of cut out fiber like the week before. Other people are just like, no, I just eat my normal diet. So like what did you do the week leading up to Havelina to kind of make sure you're you're prepped both both like I guess glycogen wise, but then also stomach wise? I find that any problems I've ever had with nutrition have basically just been psychological more so than actually due to the nutrition. So I try to change as little as possible and just do exactly the same as I normally do and not think about it and convince myself that it does not matter what I do leading up to the race, because if I'm worried about it, then that will cause problems. Like I'll get anxious. I won't digest food as well. So I do everything I can just to like keep it extremely normal. Um, I may do a little less fiber the two days before the race. That's my exception. Because I usually eat like a really big salad for lunch and maybe I'll do a smaller one or I'll, you know, make it a peanut butter and jelly sandwich instead. But yeah. <laughs> so you kind of just, do you consistently eat that way then like salads every day and then like a PB and J's and that sort of thing? And Yeah, my, my general diet is pretty close to vegan, but not strict. I'll eat eggs a couple times a week. Um, and that's not necessarily for performance reasons or anything it's more so because of environmental impact so i i mean like my priorities with eating are like eat healthy food minimize environmental impact and then think about whether there's like other things to consider for uh performance or other daily life considerations but yeah so I think a pretty normal diet other than not eating meat or dairy. <laughs> yeah. I guess what I mean by normal diet is like <laughs> your typical diet more so than anything. Cause everyone has their idea of like what a, a normal diet is or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But with, with trying to keep it stable and consistent, not changing it leading up to a race at least, I would say I used to have like pretty bad stomach cramps, just like a side stitch that would come up during races. I haven't had a problem with it in the last three years, but I would say in my first couple of years of running, I think I was extra anxious during racing basically. And sometimes during workouts too, I would just be like really anxious and worried about it. Um, and that would cause me to get these side stitches. And it sometimes would leak into the week before the race, where if I was thinking about it a lot and overstressed and like trying to do things with my diet or the rest of my life, the week leading up to the race, I would start getting a side stitch from just like sitting there doing nothing, um, like five days before a race. But I think that was all stress related and like completely separate from what I was actually eating or how much or timing or anything like that. I think it was a hundred percent stress. So I just try to not stress about it at all. And that's led to the like best outcomes that I've had for the last couple of years. Just like, just be a less worried overall person. <laughs> if you can calm yourself down a bit and like stop over worrying about things, then it's better. <laughs> it's pretty interesting how like being stressed out can affect your digestion and everything. And if you like, experience that during a race, it's like, okay, now you're not digesting properly and potentially getting nauseous or just stomach pain or stitches like you were saying. Yeah. And I think, I think it is usually a psychological problem. At least it was for me. 
and people try to experiment with different foods or different timing or different other things. And they're trying to solve, I think, a psychological problem with a nutritional intervention. And they should probably consider the option. Like there are real reasons that nutrition will matter and impact things a lot, but like getting the psychological part of it first, I think matters a lot too. I would totally agree with that. It's interesting how like, like I've noticed this in my personal life and I'm like you were saying too, like when, when I'm stressed or when you're stressed or something, it's like, oh man, like things just feel harder and your body's not functioning properly. So like if you're adding that on top of the stress of running say a 50 or hundred K or hundred mile or something, like it's obviously going to be a factor there in your, your digestion and how you're feeling. Yeah. So hopefully I think it's because I've become more confident over time um, or I just like have better breathing strategies for calming myself down or just like it's become routine enough that I've done enough races that it's now like, has become a non-issue for me for the last couple of years. Yeah, I guess that's one of the benefits of like lining up at bigger events. You kind of just have to de-stress yourself ahead of time. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to go properly. And then over time, it just kind of becomes like a normal thing, right? Yeah, definitely desensitized a little bit from it at this point. Um, and like Havelina felt like such a huge race when I did it last year. But now that I've been to UTMB, I know that like <laughs> what, what big actually looks like. And this is a backyard little fun thing. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is kind of funny because Havelina is such a big event and such a big party. And if you go out there, it's like, it's wild. Like it's crazy. But then like compare that to UTMB, it's kind of just like, yeah. This is almost like an aid station at UTMB or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's still plenty big. I would say it's like it's not ten times smaller. It's only you know like a third the size of of any of the individual races. So it's still plenty big and exciting. But yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody puts on a good show out there, so it's always a lot of fun. It's a good race every year. Yeah, which is another huge thing that reduces stress that like everyone, like you're just walking around the headquarters area the day before the race and you just hear laughter. Like if you just close your eyes and walk around a little bit, there's like laughter all around you. It's amazing. Like that's exactly what you want to be around leading up to a race and during a race. It's awesome. Oh yeah, definitely. Like all these little things that like, I guess contribute to, to the race environment and vibe and stuff. So then, um, yeah, I guess, I don't know, just life stress and whatever starts out of the way. Like what did you eat the night before the race? Like, did you just have like, I don't know, PB and J and a couple eggs or something? Or did you, <laughs> what did you end up doing? We camped at the race headquarters the night before the race, partly because just the logistics of not having to transition into a car and out was like the highest priority. But yes, yeah, so we were in a tent and so we brought our backpacking stove and we just like made a backpacking meal. So I think, I think I did, uh, it was, uh, like an Indian potato and chickpea curry with rice. Was my pre race meal, like a backpacking, <laughs> backpacking meal. Does that sort of thing not affect you? Because I know, like, generally, or just in general, anyways, like backpacking meals kind of mess up my stomach. And then whatever, oh, really? the curry didn't bother you at all? No, I think they're extra good. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, like, rice and potatoes are pretty digestible. The backpacking meals are usually pretty salty. So maybe it helped with like a little bonus sodium loading. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, no consequences of going with curry beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting because like, I know if I had anything similar, like remotely similar to that, I'd be feeling it the next day, but I guess it just, everyone's different, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then what'd you do the morning of the event? Did you just have another normal breakfast you normally do? I'm assuming you didn't have a backpacking meal or something. Uh, I did use the, I did use the backpacking stove again, but just to make, <laughs> just to make a little bit of oatmeal uh yeah just a small bowl of oatmeal and then yeah. some coffee is that pretty standard for you just like oatmeal and coffee or whatever yeah i think i'll i usually like i i work a pretty typical nine to five ish with like a bunch of flexibility in it but that means i throughout the summer at least i'm waking up at five and then running starting my run between five thirty and six um and if I wake up that early, then I usually feel like I don't need to eat anything beforehand. And so it was borderline for Avelina. Like I would consider eating nothing before the race um, and just coffee, which I, but for, for big workouts and for every race, I've always eaten something. And so 
a typical small amount of oatmeal is fits within the range of what is normal. I guess not to get too off topic from Havelina, but did you do the same thing at um, CCC this year? Uh, I also had, yeah, small, the same, small below oatmeal. Even though CCC was like, started at 9 a.m. instead of 6 a.m. And you have to take a bus to get there. So like it was a couple hours between waking up, like a couple extra hours compared to Havelina. But yeah, same thing. Yeah, cool. And what about like race day nutrition? Like, did you have like a whole plan for it? Because I guess for people that don't know, like at Havelina, you essentially run five 20 mile loops, give or take on the first loop. And you just have like, what a consistent plan laid out or did you kind of wing it or what was your strategy for that? And I guess also knowing that you're going to have aid stations, what is there three out there? And then you have home base or headquarters. Yeah. I use the same plan that I've always used for the last few years. And I eat something every 30 minutes, whether it's a, and usually my things are just a gel, a waffle, or my savory options are peanut butter pretzels usually. Um, or I'll do potato-based things or like broths or things if it's a cold race that takes actually a lot longer. But um, yeah, so my plan is usually eat, eat something every 30 minutes. I stuck to that pretty well for a lot of the race, um, but then had to adapt a little bit after the first few hours because I was feeling full and like felt like too much. So I ended up actually eating a lot less during Havelina than I than I planned to, but yeah, my typical is, is just that. And then I'll use scratch hydration mix and that it's not like a high calorie drink mix, but if I'm drinking three bottles of that per loop, that's like 250 calories. So it's almost like a hundred calories an hour. Um, so that's a decent amount of the calories I was getting as well as just from the scratch hydration mix. Interesting. Are you, are you mainly using the, the scratch then for like electrolytes and stuff, or is that a separate strategy that you had laid out? Yeah, mainly just for the salt, um, but it tastes good too. And the down, like, there's no downside. I think of a little extra sugar um, coming from it. So yeah, I would agree with that honestly, the scratch is pretty tasty stuff, and it's like a good glucose fructose blend blend in there, and it's like it's tasty, like it's good, especially when it's cold. Which I'm assuming you probably had some ice there at headquarters every lap. Yep, yep. Throwing some throwing some ice in in the bottle as well as in the pack and bandana. Um, but I was somewhat flexible. Like I just carried a little extra food, like whether I wanted a different flavor of gel or whether I wanted a gel versus a waffle or peanut butter pretzels, I just like carried one or two extra things per loop at Havelina, knowing that I could drop it off and not have to carry it for too, too long. Um, but I was doing, I would just pick up like a handful of things each loop from the headquarters area and then just try to blow through aid stations pretty quickly where the only thing I was doing at aid stations was just refilling a bottle. Yeah. The time, the couple times I saw you, I think at rattlesnake, it's like with a third one, right? The one right before headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed like you were just kind of in and out really quick and had everything really dialed. Yeah. And now when you're like running downhill, it's less than 30 minutes back to headquarters. So, you know, you're just like topping off from that point and you're about to like get your real stuff pretty soon. So I feel like that was the shortest aid station stop compared to the other two. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense then. So like what brand of, of gels and waffles were you using? Curiosity. Yeah, well, for the gels, I'm going to have to figure out something new because <laughs> uh, I like the Cliff gels the most, but they've been discontinued, so they're not making them anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to have to figure something out. Uh, and I did a round of testing last year, like a bunch of different options. And I hated most of them. <laughs> they either taste like super chemically or they're like super high volume, the isotonic ones or like weird textures. I don't know. Like generally a lot of them are bad, <laughs> uh, but cliff gels have, I've been happy with, but now I got to sign something new, but yeah, that's what I was using. <laughs> I can't believe you use cliff gels. Like I haven't had those in years. And when I first used them, I was just like, oh, I can't even choke these things down. They're just, <laughs> for me, I thought they were awful, but. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do instead? I need recommendations. <laughs> well, I, I love precision gels. Like they're just neutral tasting. And I know, the, the caffeinated ones are a little bitter from the caffeine in them, but the normal ones are just nice. They just go down easy. That and Martin gels, I think are, are my favorite. Okay. I think that both of them have similar textures that I did not like. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Are you a texture guy then? Is, is that what you uh, you go for? 
I'm not usually, but I, I guess in the world of gels, I've had the luxury of being picky, but not anymore. Dang, Daniel. Sorry about Cliff, then. That's a that's a, deal, or a heartbreaker for you. Maybe I'll start experimenting with my, making my own or something. You could do that. Like, yeah. I, I do a lot of cycling, too, and they always make their own drink mixes. It's like, out of like basically cane sugar so, and salt, so I don't know. Can't be yeah. that hard, right? Exactly. It's it's on my mind because John Albin at CCC was using his own homemade drink mix and gels. And I was like, oh, this guy, he's thinking hard about it. <laughs> really? He made his own mix and gels? Yeah. I did not know that. That's interesting. Do you know what he did with them or did you just ask him about it? Uh, we didn't talk in detail, but it was. Yeah, it seemed like he just dumped some sugar and some salt in there, and that was it. I don't. I don't know if he had a gelling agent for for gels, but yeah, it was like a pretty simple ingredient list. That's pretty interesting. But I guess when you think about it, though, like it is pretty straightforward. Like the basics of it, anyways. It's like some glucose, fructose, whatever, and like you get this like pretty good combo there, and just if it tastes good to you, like whatever. And like I don't think it needs to be overly complicated, and that may actually cause a lot of stomach issues with a lot of people. Or maybe it's psychological, like you were saying. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, interesting then. So, um, yeah, well, that was that's really interesting, I guess, that you use cliff gels and whatever, but in the scratch. But um, afterwards, did you do anything to recover specifically? Because you finished strong. Like, you came in. Like, obviously, you won a golden ticket, and you, you won, so you are stoked, and you did a little dance at the finish, which was cool. But um, <laughs> how, did, how did you feel afterwards? Like, how did recovery go and everything? Was it just, yeah, how was it? Yeah, it was all right. Well, okay. Maybe the other thing I'll share about nutrition during the race is that like, I did feel like I followed my nutrition plan for the first five hours, I think like eating something every 30 minutes, most of it being gels and then a couple, like a waffle or two in there. And then some, like a couple servings of peanut butter pretzels early on actually. But I ate like about 600 calories on both of the first two loops. So by five hours in, I'd eaten like 1200 calories. And that's pretty normal for me. Like, I guess the range that I've always thought of is you either take 30 minutes off of the total time and then 250 calories per hour. And that's on the low end or sorry, 30 minutes off and then 300 calories per hour would be the high end. And then 60 minutes off and 250 calories per hour would be the low end. So that's usually like my, my range. But, um, so I was on that for the first five hours, but I just felt kind of full the whole time. Like I was like getting the food in, but I wasn't, I didn't really crave it or want it that much. And so I let myself back off just a little bit. And I think I was like 450 calories on lap three. And then I just, my appetite went down a little bit and definitely being hot made it harder to eat. Um, and the only time I had any appetite was right after cooling off at an aid station is when I could try to get some food in. But on lap four, I was definitely getting worried that like, I wasn't taking in much food and I was hoping that wasn't going to lead to a, a crash and a bonk, but I only ate, I only did 300 calories on that lap. And then on the last lap, I took in nothing but the, but the bottles of scratch. So for the last like five plus hours of the race, I had less than 600 calories. So so on, on average for the race, I was just under 200 calories per hour. Um, but that was a little bit of an anomaly for me. And I was starting to get worried about it because like, you know, there's, I feel like there's more stories out there right now and they're very useful about people taking in like 400 calories per hour during this race. And there's like, they just put in more and they kept on feeling better and they kept on eating more. Um, and I wish that had been true for me and I would have had like even more energy, but and I was getting nervous on towards the ends of lap three and beginning of lap four that like, if I wasn't getting enough in, then I was going to crash and not have energy at the end. Um, but I tried to stay calm about it. And, you know, sometimes you just like, don't actually need a ton. Um, and you can get away with it. And so I, but I don't know, I felt like I got away with it basically rather than it being actually like a perfect nutrition day for me, um, during the race. Um, yeah, that's really interesting considering how like i guess with some running like ultra running stuff and also a lot of cycling people are doing like 100 120 grams of carbs an hour which is an insane amount of calories to push down and here you are like basically doing a lot less than that like i know it wasn't like what you planned for but it's interesting how you can still finish strong um, even if things aren't exactly ideal yeah um yeah 
So it yeah. did happen in this instance, at least. That's one story of like, I did less than 200 calories per hour during this race and it still went well. But that is the least I think I've done in a race that I've done well in. So, um, but I do think like that set me back a little bit that like it was a little bit harder to recover afterwards. Um, for the first couple of days, I just like felt extra achy and stiff and was waking up in the middle of the night to eat some more food so that I could fall asleep. That's <laughs> usually my limit of like if i if i don't eat enough then i can't sleep well and so that's usually my sign that i need to eat a little bit more and then i'll sleep well so it's a useful signal oh yeah definitely that's for sure uh do you feel like looking back now that you wish you would have done maybe more drink mix to just up your caloric intake on those last couple laps yeah either that or more heat management like i did um like I threw ice in a pack on laps two and four and I carried a nice bandana for lap three, but only for lap three. And I think I, and I was dunking myself at every single aid station in water, but like the section from coyote to jackass aid one to aid two, it takes like a little over an hour, most laps or maybe just a little, like about an hour. And the ice bandana has dried out and like you've dried out. And I think I was just like, you're running uphill, you're burning like a little bit hotter. And so just like felt overheated at that point. So anything, I, maybe I should have carried a bottle with me just to like dunk on myself for the second half of it or done something else to cool myself off. Cause I think that could have helped just like increase appetite. But yeah, I do think the, like if I just put more calories in my bottles, then that could have been like the other alternative ad adaptation I could have put in. Yeah. Interesting. This is kind of off topic, but do, do you kind of enjoy looking back at the puzzle and like, okay, like I ran this race and it went well, but these things I could do better for say states or something. Yeah. I do feel like I need to get it more correct at states. Maybe it states like there's no aid station gaps that are quite as long as that. Maybe Michigan Bluff to Forest Hill takes almost an hour. So you can cool off a little more frequently, which helps, but like, I'm definitely paying attention to that and not like, walking away from Havelina being like, wow, I won the race. Like it was awesome. Like it was perfect. No need to reconsider anything. Uh, <laughs> there's definitely things to learn. And, uh, yeah, having experiences on like, on like ups and downs on either side of things, like eating a lot, not eating a lot, being hot, really good at managing the heat, like the knowing the ranges of those things just like is all useful experience that adds up to, being able to respond and adapt to a situation in a future race. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that ultra running is such a, an experience based sport that it's not just how fit you are. It like the experience matters a ton. Yeah, definitely. I think like being comfortable with it and like, like you're saying earlier, like the psychological aspect of it, just being comfortable and knowing how long you're going to be out there for. And then, I don't know, it's just like live and learn, right? Like, you're always going to learn something from every race you do or every event or long run. And it's like kind of just a snowball effect of hopefully positive things that you learn. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely want to be fully open to learning every time I show up to a race that like, I don't think I just know everything and I'm going to be like paying attention. Yeah, well, let's, um, let's shift gears a little bit out of nutrition and just go over to your pacing strategy. Cause like I was saying, I don't remember if we're recording or not, but you just look super smooth like the entire day. And a couple of guys I was talking to the day before, like they had their splits laid out to basically run golden ticket pace from the year prior, I think from what Dakota ran. And then you guys, just, you went out and like, it was, it was a fast race. Like it was incredibly fast, but you looked smooth and consistent the entire time. So did you have a, like a pacing strategy set out specifically to win or was it kind of like based off what other people were doing or how did that kind of um, look for you? I was basing... Okay, well, I had last year's splits from myself, and I paced last year in 2022, Havelina, like extremely well, far better actually than this year. At least on paper, it was more consistent and more even, um, like a smaller difference in times between each lap. And Dakota's times were pretty good, I think, but mine were even more even, which is why I caught him on lap four, but then he had like a really fast last lap to, to take the win. Um, so I knew I had, I had my times from last year that felt like they were basically 
perfect in terms of like ratios between them. Like I think it makes sense to slow down a little bit during the race because of the temperature. Like the first lap is expected to be a little bit faster because it's cooler and the last lap too, but less so. Like the first thing in the morning is there is the coldest. Like that's where you can run the fastest. You have to carry the least amount of stuff. You stop never. Um and then you slowly like like slow down your pace a little bit on laps two through four and it's getting hotter through each of those so it makes sense to back off a little bit um but yeah i think running basically an even pace was the right strategy minus like a few minutes for each lap for that like accounting for temperature for the most part and going into the race this year i basically like, talked to my coach about strategy and like we weren't gonna i wasn't gonna try to play any games or like do anything showy or like make any moves like i was gonna try to run a fast time and that was what i expected to be the way to get a golden ticket i knew that i was like far fitter than last year there's like long runs at the same pace were coming easily and like workouts were all a little bit faster so and also yeah, more confidence and like belief in myself, more experience. So all of those things meant that I definitely knew that I could go faster than last year. And like the six minutes between me and Dakota's time also felt like a pretty easy to gap to bridge. So I definitely was thinking I was going to go under the course record, maybe 1245. And then like, I knew Matt Daniels had 1230 in his head. And like, that's really fast, but also like, the runs that we had done together felt pretty easy at that pace. And like, it was almost imaginable to be able to do that. Um, so there's like a range of unknown that was, I felt like there was still like 15 or 20 minutes of uncertainty, like between the, like somewhere between 1230 and 1258. <laughs> um, so like, I wasn't too tied to exact splits and I didn't even write them down. I just took last year's, numbers as like information and benchmarks i suppose and also knew that there was like some range of flexibility um but then my thoughts on pacing have really changed actually since ccc for the most part because that that race is stupid it like everyone starts off at like a 5 30 mile pace and we run <laughs> we run the first 20 the first 20 minutes of the race at 5 30 pace until we hit the single track and then we like start hiking uphill and it's a, like a, a more cautious, like six thirty to seven minute pace for the rest of the first climb. And then like, but by the end, the equivalent pace that we've run is like eight minute pace or something like that because of like the technical terrain and ups and downs and things. But like, it is not at all an even pace, but no one's ever been successful at that race in like attempting to run an even pace. And so I think part of it is because of the like single track it being narrowed down and you get bottlenecked and you get stuck behind people. But then again, like if that slowing you down for the first hour of an 11 hour race is probably okay. But I didn't, so I like really didn't understand how that made any sense. Like how could that be the right pacing strategy to do well at CCC? But everyone does it. So I guess I'm going to do it too and find out what it like, why, um, <laughs> But I think the reason why is like psychological, like from a physiological perspective, even pacing makes sense. Like you're going to break down your body less. You're more capable of like running an even pace, but there's so much psychological benefit to being near the front. And at CCC with so many fans on the course, you're getting cheered on so differently by the fans. Everyone looks at you differently. You think about yourself differently and that confidence and also just like the bonus cheers from the fans just creates this crazy feedback loop that just gives you more and more energy. So you don't actually lose all of that time. Like you're still running slower at the end, but you wouldn't have been running faster if you had gone slower earlier. So I remembered that from CCC about pacing that like, there's something to be said for being near the front. Like that really changes how you feel and how people are responding to you too. So so I had that in my head too, in addition to this, like, yeah, I paced extremely well at Havelina last year. I need to like do the same thing. And like even splits was like definitely the way to have success. But like when we started off the start line at Havelina, I knew I wanted to be near the front 
at the very beginning, just because like as soon as you hit single track, there's a big dusty section. And I remember last year being in like 20th place and just like coughing up dust <laughs> and like, and, like it just being like a cloud in front of my headlamp that I couldn't really see anything because of all of the dust. So I was like, okay, I'm going to avoid that. And I'm, and I know that it's not that big of a deal if I like run to the near the front, at least for that, those few minutes. And then I can back off if I need to and want to, but, um, I don't know. I just like fell into rhythm with Matt for the most part, the two of us, led for the first half of the first loop and then like a few other guys caught up to us and we were running with a pack of like five or six going from miles 10 to 20. Um, but it felt like within range and okay that we were running like low seven minute mile pace or like, I guess the equivalent of slightly sub seven minute mile pace for the first, I don't know, 10 ish miles, um, that I didn't think that we were going to pay that drastically for it like maybe we would give back that time later on but i didn't think we would give back that time and more um and like just like the confidence of running from the front was worth it um that for the psychological benefit even though like it wasn't perfectly even paced um yeah so i think we ran the first two laps well i don't know i don't have the exact paces on it but um the first two laps were very fast. The third lap was like, I think I ran at two thirty four, and then the fourth lap was where I was slowed. I slowed down a lot on that one. I ran like a two forty three, and so that was almost like a ten minute drop, and that's where I left the most time out there for sure. Um, but I was able to turn it around and run a fast last lap in like two twenty eight, like something like that. So I do like the only laps in which I really lost time because of starting a little bit fast, I think was lap four. And maybe that one could have been a little bit faster, but I still wouldn't have done it differently. Like I wanted to be in the front and that like gave me confidence and like gave me motivation to run harder than I would have. So I think the total change, like the total, the total time I think was a little bit faster, even though like on paper, like from a physiological standpoint, it was not like ideal pacing. Now that makes a lot of sense. Do you think part of the the slower lap four was just simply because of the heat? Like you were saying earlier? I think so. I, I don't, I didn't feel like my muscles were breaking down cause I was tired. It was more just like, I felt hot and th like wasn't taking in food as much because I was hot. And yeah, I think that was the main thing. It's just like felt hot enough to make a difference. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And then I guess thinking too about the terrain, because it's been forever since I've ran like the, the extra little bit on the first loop, but doesn't it bottleneck pretty quickly? Like you start, obviously like you go through headquarters at that, like, however quarter half mile long, like loop through the tents. And there's kind of like a wide, like quote unquote single track, but then doesn't it narrow down to like super narrow single track pretty soon? out of headquarters when you yeah. start the lap. Yeah. 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 It's like pretty, <laughs> that's like the hardest point of the course to be passing people who aren't on other laps where it's like tight, they're tighter turns and they're a little more awkward. Um, where I like bump shoulders with people more often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it makes sense then, I guess, to kind of go out like UTMB style and go out hard at the beginning to kind of get a better position. Right. Yeah. But I also, I like, I was aware that like, there was going to be a scenario in which it'd be too fast, but like, it wasn't a 530 mile off the start line. Like it was at CCC. We were still like, you know, 630 to seven minute pace. And like, that was like, oh yeah, this is fine. We can do this. This is definitely worth being in the front for this. Yeah. In hindsight, would you, would you have wanted to have done 530 pace off the start line? Uh, that was, okay. <laughs> this is my alternative race, race strategy to, to, to time trying and trying to run fast it was like the stupid idea that went through my head leading up to the race was like, what if I just blast it to the first aid station and I just run it CCC style and I run five, I can run five thirties to the first aid station. I'll need to slow down a lot, but like everyone else would be like, Whoa, what is happening? Like it would really throw off the rest of the field. Um, so that went through my head, but like, <laughs> I think I cared too much about the final results to do something like them. 
<laughs> they definitely played it smart, but it also would have been fun to watch from a spectator perspective of you just watching yeah. going out or watching you go out at five thirty uh, pace. <laughs> yeah, you know, someday, someday I'll just go for the gimmicks rather than <laughs> the, the performance, but not this time. <laughs> yeah, just take top to, take top ten at states this year, then you can go do the same thing next year, Avalon, and then go out super fast. Another two hour lap. <laughs> That sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about states then, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, you've won two tickets to get into states, right? You were saying at Bandera and at Havelina the year prior, right? Yep. So I get a, a third chance to go get it right, because I didn't get it right the first two times. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, not to bring up uh, bad memories or thoughts, but uh, what went wrong the first couple times? The Yeah, so the first time... I think was mainly just like one nutritional mistake, actually. Um, like I started off in about 10th place through the first couple of aid stations. And then I passed a bunch of people in the canyons and then coming into forest Hill in 2022, I was in, I was running with two other guys, Vincent Viet and Arlen Glick, and we were in third through fifth place. And so that was like dreams coming true. Like, Whoa, like I'm in third place right now. And like, we are, it feels right. Like this feels fine. Like, this is awesome. Like I'm going to do this. And like visions of crossing the finish line on the podium was like already going through my head during the race. But like shortly after forest Hill, I was just like stopping on the side of the trail with diarrhea, like every mile or two. And then that eventually that made me super dehydrated and ended up walking a lot of the last 50 K of the race. But I think the thing that led to that was I drank like a super, like the hyper hydration drink um, at dusty corners, like mile 40 or so. So it was just like an hour or two before getting to that section where I was starting to have GI distress. And that was basically, I just like chugged a whole bottle of it. And so that was like two grams of sodium. I think it was 1800 milligrams um, all in one go. And I was like trying to be ahead of salt needs because like that's better than being behind. You don't want to be hyponatremic. And I was like in my head going into the race. But I think I like all at once, two grams of sodium was it's like the equivalent of like, you know, six or seven salt pills at once. <laughs> um, so that was too much and caused and I didn't realize that that if you if you go really high on sodium, that can act as a diuretic. So don't do that. Like drip, drip <laughs> sodium. <laughs> so that was, that was the mistake of year one, but otherwise like, like I like managed the heat really well and I thought I like was prepared and things. And then this year I, I think I may have come in a little overtrained. Like I was just a little bit tired, whether that was physical or mental or both. Um, but early on in the race, I had thoughts of like, Oh, my like quads feel kind of tired. Ugh, like I kind of wish I was in the crew rather than running the race right now. And those are like dangerous thoughts to be having at mile 15. Um, so, and I, and I, so I was really scared of that turning into something worse. And so I moderated my effort and like went with a slower pace early on, but then I kind of like just stayed in that slow pace the entire way. So I just ran consistently but slow the entire time the second the second time back of this year in 2023 so i like i mean i ran fast like i ran a 16 30 something and that was a lot better than i had done in 2022 because i didn't like walk the last 50k but um i still like wasn't like in the race really um because i think i was a little overtrained and and like mentally fatigued going in um so i want to maintain my stoke and energy that i had for the first time but you know be, have my experience and like not make any nutritional mistakes but um yeah be ready to like work really hard and make it hard because i think that was a problem with the second time that I was like, okay, like I really screwed that up. I want to I want to avoid any major big mistakes. I'm okay making small mistakes and, and like not caring about the little things. It's okay if I run a little bit slower, but it turns out like just like running a little bit slower 
the entire time adds up to a lot of time lost. Um, so this year, yeah, hopefully I like get those things right. I like come to the race, you know, like not under, not over prepared and I don't make any mistakes and I'm like ready to, to work really, really hard and understand that it's going to be a bit painful and difficult at times, but I like, I do want that experience. I want to like go through that experience and respond to the challenge. So, you know, I got so many months between now and then to actually prepare for it, but, um, yeah, um, it's the race that I care about the most in the world. And I'm from California. So my family gets to be there and get to see it. It's got the most, I mean, it's like, I'm a U.S runner. So of course I care about the U S race the most. And, uh, so that's where my heart is. And I really, really, really want to do my best at it. So what are you going to change then besides not downing two grams of sodium <laughs> at once and going in way overtrained? <laughs> not much. I think, uh, I guess I'll have to find a new gel. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll be dabbling with like different drink mixes and things as alternatives. But, um, no, I just, yeah, I think I know how to like cool off in the heat. I think I know the course pretty well. So I just want to like show up ready to try my best and execute on the things that I know how to do. Yeah, you definitely have like the talent and the ability to do it. So it'd be cool to see you kind of fine tune everything and, and figure it out this year or this coming year, I should say. I want to see that too. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine, man. <laughs> Uh, do you have any events on your calendar lined up to kind of prep for it? Or are you just kind of going to fly low key for the next few months? I don't know yet. Yeah. I definitely want to race again at a, at least a reasonably competitive race between now and States. It's just like, there's so much time and regardless of whether that's the right lead up to States or not, like I just like running races is there's a reason I'm in this sport and running races generally, um, of course I want to do them like they're great growth experiences, like growth opportunities. They're fun. They give a purpose to my day to day. And so like, I'm going to sign up for something, but I don't know exactly what it'll be yet. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't know. It's like, yeah, racing is part of the reason why we do this, right? Like one running is just fun in itself and enjoyable, but doing something competitive and testing yourself, improving yourself is great. Yeah. You go to a different, different level of learning and challenge at races when you like actually show up and do your honest best, then like you can't hide behind anything. And that really reveals everything that you've done in the lead up and, and how you're doing at that moment. Yeah. And I guess thinking of that, this is kind of off topic, but like I was thinking about this this morning on my run that one thing I really like about running is like you, like you're saying, you can't hide from things Like either come in and you're fit and ready to go or not. Like you can't fake it. Like, there's some, some sports where you can be like, okay, well, I, I bought a faster bike, so that increased like whatever my speed or whatever. But like with running, you really can't do that. Like maybe with carbon shoes to a certain extent, but it's not the same. Like, <laughs> Yeah, new new shoes make me run faster, but I think a lot of it is pussy, pussy. You know? It's like, <laughs> oh, sweet. Like new shoe day, we're running fast. Um, yeah, you totally can't hide. You bring, you bring your full self to ultras, um, like mental, physical, your past, your present, um, and like things that you don't even know are stressing you out, just show up and like present as worse performance or other, <laughs> other things. Um, so there's your subconscious is that work too. You're bringing that to your race too, but yeah, it's definitely your whole self. Yeah. The psychological aspect is so interesting. And I know like people always talk about it, like, Oh, like mind over matter or whatever, like mind's so important in running, like whatever, but like, it, it really does make a difference. Like I, I know it's like when I'm stressed out and go into a workout, my workout usually sucks. Like if, if I go in a good headspace and like ready to go, like it's a lot better and it's definitely the same thing in racing is if I'm worried about like a girlfriend or whatever. And it's like, I start this race and it sucks. It's like, yeah, like it's not their fault necessarily, but it's me like overthinking and dwelling on things versus focusing on the actual run. Yeah, for sure. I have had the other experience where I've been super negative and be like, Oh, I don't want to do this workout. Like this is going to be hard. Like I'm just going to jog this one. Like I'm just going to half ass it. But then like my first split of an interval or something is actually only a couple seconds off. And I'm like, oh, well, 
I guess it's not that terrible of a day. And then like I end up doing a, having like a pretty solid workout. I have had that happen, which like being super grumpy and negative going into a workout and having it still end up being okay. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule for sure. Uh, definitely the boost of like being positive matters for most workouts. <laughs> definitely. I would agree with that 100%. I think the science does back that up as well. That like the mindset there is like super crucial. Like I can't name any studies off the top of my head, but I've listened to a lot of it. Yeah, I trust. It's, it just like makes sense. So no need yeah. to question it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, cool, man. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up here. Um, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It was interesting to hear about Havelina and a little bit about CCC as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a good time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, where can people find you and like where you're at? Strava, Instagram and all that good stuff. Yeah, I'm most active on Strava, meaning like all of my runs auto upload. And I usually will put a note or a title or something on them. Uh, and I have an Instagram too. I'm less active there, but I definitely show up and I respond to messages and things there. So uh, my Instagram handle is John Ray, spelled the actual way. And then <laughs> under, underscore say Ray, spelled R A Y, because that's how you actually pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes a lot of sense. I had no idea why it was say Ray. I wasn't sure, but. Now I get it. <laughs> Someday, maybe I'll just change my name. But <laughs> nah, dude, don't disrespect your family. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I won't tell it. That was not, that was not on the table. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I'll let you go. Um, but I'll see you at states or something, if not earlier. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. All right, yeah, man. Have a good one.